Hello everybody, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement, and we're here with Reverend Hayden. Before we start, just want to acknowledge the lands that we're meeting on and acknowledge our uh, Indigenous uh, brothers and sisters, uh, leaders, past, present and emerging. Reverend Hayden, can you tell us a little bit about the church that you are a priest at? Um, at the moment, I'm at St. Paul East Q in Melbourne. So I'm part of the Melbourne Diocese. Oh, yep. excellent. And what's the church like? So for someone who's never been there, what, what's, what's the, what does it look like? What's the history of it? What kind of services do you have there? So um, we do have the, we call it contemporary service, which is only introduced about like five years ago. And but most of our parishioners and the worship style is based on the um, um, traditional Eucharist service, and that's kind of service. Um, and also, as well as we do have our meditation service um, in the afternoon. Yeah. Oh, excellent, excellent. And do you have like uh, sort of youth groups, community service groups, anything like that? Um, we do have a youth group, but they are more um, only um, only a small number, mm -hmm. and so which um, and also we do have a program that what we do is um, once a month we catch up for social gathering with meals after schools for them. That sort mm -hmm. of um, program that we have for them, yeah. Excellent. Uh, and look, what you said about it's a small group. I think that's uh, universal. I think uh, a lot of churches. Uh, even in Brisbane here where I am, you know, they either have no youth group or generally a very small um, youth group. Is the church itself historic? Um, I don't think so, no. Yeah. But so okay. the church is, um, they rebuilt it quite modern. So it is not something like a blue stone church or something like that. So. No, that's okay. And can you tell us a little bit about sort of the neighbourhood that you're in? Um, so social class speaking, educated, middle class to what that sort of um, neighbourhoods that we are in. So economically speaking, they are middle class and upper sort of oh, okay. social neighbourhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is there any sort of famous landmarks around there? We do have Yarra River, which is close by. <laughs> oh, OK. OK. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And, and what's it like being in Melbourne? Um, well, actually, this is my first time being in the East. So this is part of the East. Most, most of the time I was in the West. So moving into the East, I feel like I'm quite nervous as in because, um, you know, the West is more like country sort of style. So they're more friendly approachable. Whereas with the East, it's more like city. So my imagination is more like very independent and might not be having like sort of close community as because everyone might be busy with all their business or their work and all that sort of things. But when I actually moved in there, I quite surprised how caring and hospitable they are and very, um, um, you know, welcoming. So yeah, you know, they are quite friendly, cozy sort of family type um, sort of community. Oh, excellent, excellent. So you had the idea that they, being the city, they wouldn't be as friendly, but uh, you found yeah. out that they're very friendly. Yeah. Now, have you been there long in Melbourne? Um, so at East Q, I've been there for um, a year. Oh, okay, okay. So you've, you've certainly sort of settled in and you've, you've been to Luna Park and all the important things. Yeah. Oh, excellent. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, like why you became a priest? Um, that's a very long story to begin. So I think what happened was um, when I, I came here to Australia when I was a teenage and, um, and also what happened is um, I finished my year 10, we'd be doing my VCE and I'm kind of I actually, to be honest, my very fit as a childhood, I always dream of becoming a detective. Oh, okay. That sort of that sort of work or career that I want to be. But when I, you know, as a when I came here as a teenage person, um, cross culture, 
build identity and belonging um, into the position as I become, I don't know where I belong, which part of, which group I belong, what sort of my identity. So I, because as a teenager, you start discovering your identity and belonging, but when I move here, I kind of like losing my identity and belonging and I become, I don't know who I am anymore as in, because I feel like I don't belong to anywhere, that sort of position. And also when I, so before VCE, of course, everyone asking you, what do you want to be? And I become like, I don't know. Detective is out of question because I don't know any rules and regulation and the law or anything. And I don't think my English is enough to be in all those sort of like high subjects either. So I kind of like lost hope in that sort of industry. But there was a time that, um, so at that time at home, no one is at home. I was by myself. I was praying, kneeling, praying. And I asked God, what do you want me to be? What's your life plan for me? Because my dreams and my plan doesn't seem to be like going to work anymore. So what's your plan? That's the question that I'm asking God at that moment. So I was praying and fasting and see where God's going to lead me. Um, I didn't get the answer straight away, but it took me a while that God reminded me of my the word that I heard when I was a child, that your fathers love you. And at that point, I realized that because I heard that voice when I was about seven or eight years old, after I prayed with my dad and then my dad told me to have meditations on it, listen to God voice. And that's the word that I heard. But as a child, I always thinking, yeah, of course, he's my dad. So he need to love me. But now as I grow old at that age, as a teenage praying to God, I heard exactly the same voice again. And I realized that this is not my earthly father that it's talking. It's more like my heavenly father. So I tried to finish my high school without thinking too much. I quite have peace in mind. And growing up, I become like, I want to work in a um, developing country as a missionary. So I started my theological school. And a few people came up to me and say, do you want to be a priest? And my answer is very strong, no. And even the archbishop asked me, do you want to be a priest? And I told him three times, I say, no, I don't want to be. So I'm quite strong on that because my aim is to become a missionary overseas, like developing country, third world country, rather than being a priest. But there was a time that um, I was in youth group, start of the year, um, one of the leaders who came and told us, there is a different, you know, different biodiversity is rolling in the paper and which is all there and then she she told us to pick one each and whichever bible verse we get to meditate on it for the whole year to see what god is speaking to you through this bible verse this message what message he tried to give you so we did that and then at that time my heart was so yeah, my heart beating is so fast and rise and I become like, I don't know why, but the only thing that I keep on praying is, I don't want to receive, you know, Matthew 23. That's in my head. So to be honest, I have to tell you that that's my favorite childhood Bible verse. But as I become um, a young adult, I become like, I don't want that Bible at that time. And, and then I, I just, pick one I didn't even choose whereas my friends they choose carefully as if when I say they choose they roll the paper they vote they cannot see it but they try to you know do things around before they choose that I just pick it up anyway and then when everyone is open up and read what message they got and I become like I know I just don't feel good to open it now so I didn't open it after youth um, church youth service I went to the Eucharist service and um, at that time during after the service during the notice I feel so calm and my heart is keep on telling me just to open it just open it just open so 
I did open it and yes, I got that message and I became like, God, I knew it, but you know that I don't want to be doing that. But yeah, that's when all things started. But um, it is not an easy decision. Me and my parents, my whole family, we went to many silence retreats, prayers, fasting, just to see where God is calling me and where he, how he want to use me. So yeah. So that's how all the journey started. Oh, it's amazing. That's amazing. I find it interesting that you, you said you wanted to be a detective, but what put you off that was, I don't actually know the rules or the laws. It wasn't like, oh, I just got older and didn't want to be a detective. It was, I, I don't actually know any of the, the laws here about what I have to do as a detective. I like how you said when you first prayed for an answer, you didn't get an answer because often we hear people will say, you know, I, I thought if you prayed, you got an answer straight away and, you know, why am I getting an answer? But sometimes, you know, we, we don't get an answer. We don't hear the, we don't hear the answer. What was formation like, the, the experience of actually, you know, when you started to study as, as a priest, what was that, to study to become a priest? What was that uh, process? I already studied theology before I decided to become a priest. So mm -hmm. I just, I accepted the calling on my very last semester of the year. Mm -hmm. So I started my study before that. So it is, I answer the call closer to my, like closer to my study. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. So when I study, it is um, very, um, I tried to study, it's hard, I have to say. And I did admit, um, I did tell my lecturers uh, um, at the end of the year, I, I um, you know, we have um, bishop's dinner and then someone invited to me because one of the students have to speak, um, not have to, but one of the students, you know, have, you know, have a chance to speak mm -hmm. and then they chose me on that year. And I did say, I thought that I, when I tried to study um, theology, I know extremely hard, the, the language is so hard. And then I realized that I'm not only, you know, learning English, I'm learning like other languages as well, because all their words are formed with the other language. So I have to say it's really hard, but I do have a very supportive um, lecturers and um you know, peers group who truly mm -hmm. like helped me through the journey. So I do have a very positive, um, there is a hardship regardless of what sort of course you are doing, mm -hmm. but it just where your heart is, where your calling is. If you truly, I, when I call it, um, I don't say that, you know, the call to be a priesthood, but I'm just saying, every single career that we do, it's a calling. God chose us to be wherever we are, whichever fees we are at, so that his word's gonna reach out to the whole world and in every single corner of this world. So yeah, so for me, I've, as a second language, learning, you know, study the theology, I find it really challenging mm -hmm. and I find it's really hard. And when I think about it, I'll be like, I don't know how I get through, but I got through because I know that because it is not of my strength, but God's helped me through that. Yeah. Now, no one can remember what they studied at university. <laughs> at least none of my friends can. But for, for people who have never studied theology, what are, what are the subjects that you cover? What are you know, some of the things you, you, you kind of learn during theology? So we learn like um, the history, the systematic theology. It's every corner, I have to say. <laughs> so this is how I start with theology. My, a, my expectation is more into like study a Bible, but actually study a Bible and study a theology is different. Mm -hmm. That's how I know after I study the theology, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, it's certainly a, a, a different. Uh, now, you said before you wanted to be a missionary. Yeah. Why missionary and not priest? I never want to become a priest. That's one thing I can tell you. Never mm -hmm. in my... And it could be because of the influence 
I never see a priest either. So that could be possible that the priest is never triggered in my head. Oh. And whereas for me as a person, I see the priest is standing up the front teaching the people. Whereas me, I have more like community sort of spirit in me. So that I'm more, I, I feel more comfortable sitting in a circle, speaking with the people rather than having to stand up in the front, giving it, um, delivering the message. It could be, but, um, and also I do have um, a family tradition of missionaries as well. Mm -hmm. So, and also <laughs> when I was younger, I thought this story is a bit quite cute and funny because <laughs> when I was in Burma, um, there is a lot of missionary um, came to us and do program with us. And at that time, as a Sunday school kids, we always have to perform welcoming them with songs and songs and actions and all that sort of dance and all those cultures. So as a child, this is kind of like out of a joke, but this is not really what I dreamed of. I always say, when I grow up, I want to be like them so that I can travel to other countries and people can perform it for me <laughs> rather than me performing to them. But yeah, missionary is not part of my dreams as well. So, you know, um, yeah. I, I found it fascinating when you said that, you know, your, your view of the priest is they're up on the, they're up, you know, behind the pulpit you know, near the altar, whereas the missionary is, is, is with the people and that's sort of where you wanted to be, where you felt most comfortable. Um, being a priest now, how, how do you feel? Is, do you still feel like a, a kind of a bit of a division between you and the people in the church or is there more community than you thought? It's more community than I thought because I don't see what I see. But now as I'm actually doing the ministry and now myself, I'm actually being in a community five days a week. I'm with them, even though on Sunday, I'm still with them, but it's just like I'm in front, <laughs> in the front. But I don't feel any barrier on that anymore. But as a child, I feel like that's what I see. But now as being part of the community, as being journeying with them in these congregations, no, that's, not the barrier that I face anymore. I feel like we actually part of them in a community setting and nothing is separate to us between, um, you know, me and them during that time, no. No, no, that's, that's excellent. And can you tell me what it's like being a priest? So my friends who don't go to, some of my friends don't go to church, they say, you know, uh, so a priest works on a Sunday, they do the service and they go home and that's it. Well, what, what is actually a day in the life of, of being a priest? That is a lot of questions that I've been facing as well. Quite a few people who learned that I'm a priest, they always ask me, apart from Sunday, what do you actually do? <laughs> so, yeah, I get that question a lot. Um, yeah, so, what, so apart from the Sunday worships, where visibly people can see us, what we do, other things that we do is... Um, I'm also um, the assistant chaplain down in Ferris. So that is two days a week. So that is a chaplain that I, so what, what do I do that time is visiting sheep, um, welcoming seafarers, helping with their needs, advocating for them if they need us on things that, um, you know, with their rights and regulations, that, that sort of thing. So, um, is, and also, yeah, is it a shit as well? So, yeah. and also other thing is um, we do visit um, um, aged care facilities. So at the moment, we visit two aged care facilities, which is under um, our care. And also we do go and do home communion or home on um, parishioners who are housebound or in hospital and also we do um, do like visiting even though if they regularly visit it um, come into church we still do visiting for them we still visit them and be part of it journey with them so 
okay is really um, things that we really do on Sunday. So yeah, and also yeah, so and also we do have um, other admin works that we do as well. Yes, yes, admin work. Yes, we. I think we all recognise. Yes, the ad admin work. But with, with with the mission to seafarers, can you give us a little bit more information about about that? So, mission to seafarers is an organisation that under the Anglican Church in Mel. No, not in Melbourne, but we do have around the world. So the that is, <clears throat> yes, and also our. It's just like hospital chaplains or school chaplains. So our focus is to the seafarers who are so far away from their parents or their families for at least six to nine months time. And so for them being in the sea, seeing all that sort of danger. So when they come on ashore, we help them out to, to give them like relaxation and you know, depend on their physical needs, spiritual needs, mental needs, financial needs, all that sort of things that we cover for them mm -hmm. as well. So, and also some seafarers, uh, they don't know their own right when it's come to, um, like for example, they, if, if accident happened, they, they are in hospital, but before they are fully healed, the agents, I mean, the company want to send them back to their country straight away because the cost of the living here and the medication is more expensive than in their own country. Mm -hmm. So for, for them, they become like, they worry that if they faded out, that they are in pain and they couldn't travel yet. If they say that they worry that they might not be retired or they might be fired, that sort of thing. So we kind of like try to advocate for them in that and assure them and also providing a pastoral care to their families if that needed, because you away from your family, you know that one of your family member is in hospital, but you actually cannot visit or see or get any update about it. So that sort of um, things that we do virtually mm -hmm. as well, yeah. And, and when you say ships, you're not just talking about cruise ships, you're talking about, you know, trade ships. So, yeah, container ships, yeah. that sort of um, important help, yeah. Yeah. And do you go onto the ships? Are you allowed on the ships or they, 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 they come to you? Um, both. Mm -hmm. So some people, they come to us to the building and some, uh, some of the ships we visit and actually visit them in the ship, yeah. Mm -hmm. And people can volunteer with Mission to Seafarers. Is that right? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, and we are looking for what we are looking for um, volunteers who have an interest in it. Oh, okay, okay. And so the work. What does the work entail for volunteers? Um, for the volunteers, it's depend on what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, they can volunteers to do ship visitings as well. In those sort of things, of course, training is needed. Mm -hmm. So we, we will have to train them for that. And also for some people, they want to develop their skill skill or while they are looking for a job. If they want the community service, we do have, you know, bar, which is we serve to public so they can develop their skills there hub around things on that as well so yeah so there's a bar um it, i've been there I, I i walked in there and i saw the bar and i thought there's a bar here the one in brisbane doesn't have a bar it has a convenience store and I, when it was in the melbourne one i thought it's a bar but you're um, saying it's there yeah, to train but, but we do have that as because um this is how we um do the, the uh, you know earn a bit of money so that we can support the um seafarers because um we don't really take anything from the seafarers yeah and all that sort of thing so yeah so that's how so that's a bit kind of like it doesn't generate a lot of money on that i have to say mm -hmm. but it just helps as well mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, and with uh, aged care visits, what is that like? So people, you know, when they if they haven't been to aged care, if they don't have family in aged care, they see all the stuff on the news or, or, or everything that's going on in aged care. What is it like going into an aged care uh, facility? Um, so going to the aged care facility, so what we do is we provide in um, communion service as well, worship service for them as well as pastoral caring for them. So um, so most of the, um, so yeah, that sort of type things that we, um, um, we kind of like provide. And we encounter a lot of, um, so during the conversations, one thing is um, I learned about is they are old and not they are not useless by saying that is when you listen to their story once really a person who's really changed the world a person who made the world difference a person who made foundation for us or the, the younger generation we have an easier life in our society so that sort of thing so but my, but very so listening to their stories because um the um before the COVID, the survey say 43% of them don't have any visitors at all, even in a year. So they quite feel lonely. And also for some people is whenever they see other people's families visiting their mothers or grandparents, they feel more lonely in that, not having anyone visiting them. So we put, for us is we providing those sort of visits so that they feel that they do have visitors, someone who will be listening to them, someone who will learn their shoulder when they need to cry. And most of the people, when you talk to them, they lost their independence. They lost their belonging. That's how they felt so that they are in there. So even though some of them, they've been there like nine, uh, eight or nine years, but they never feel that there's this home. So yeah, to those people, what we especially, we visited them, we, we talked to them, we give them comfort so that they know that they've been loved and they're being cared for and they are in a safe hand. Even though if their family members are not there, we are there for them. And we are her or his new family member. Yeah. No, no that's amazing. That's that's amazing. Uh, it's been, they're very. It's very fortunate that 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 you that you can go there and and and, and be there with them. Um, yeah. Now, can I ask you? And this is because the census results just came out, um, talking about Christianity again and how it's uh, once again it's it's declining. As a priest, what's your kind of view on? where Christianity is in Australia, where it's heading? Um, yes, we are declining. I'm not going to deny that at all. And the and I heard too many parents or grandparents say that their kids are not in school. I mean, sorry, not in not church. Not in school, uh-oh. <laughs> sorry, their kids never attend, like, um, church and all that sort of thing. But my point, I didn't ask this question to them. But for those who are out there who are asking the same question, my question is, as a parent, as a grandparent, do we really prioritise our kids' spiritual? You know, mm -hmm. so we value their education. Therefore, we give them the best education that we can provide. But what about spiritual? And I always say and this is how i've been grown up as well they only come to church once a week in one hour time but they actually stay with you 24 7 so you as a parent and grandparents you are more influenced than the priest and also in um, perspective a priest cannot do a work alone it's it's, it's need the parents to work with us as well the parents to encourage them as well mm -hmm. and um and i realized that um, one of the experts I want to give one of lady because 
when I was in Burma, we hardly see any older people. And with the older people, they hardly volunteer work. I mean, that's church sort of work. The only thing that you will see is young people and children. They volunteer to clean up the church, they walk or flower operations, all that sort of prepared by young people. And as I'm not criticizing anyone, but as I compare my up, upbringing and now today, look at the society, I realized that when I was a child, my dad and my parent, my mom always say, on Sunday, I don't want to see you anywhere, but only in the church. So we growing up as a family and going to church once a week doesn't help us help my faith to grow but my parents are the true person who truly yes the priest sent uh, you know plant the seed but my parents are the one who really water and taking care of my spiritual growth as well so every night we have a family praise we have a bible study within the all our family do we do that with our kids now today and also on sunday we take them to sports and all that sort of activity. We teach them, even though they say, oh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to stay. I don't want. But we still encourage them to do. What about to the church? When they say, I don't want to go to church, we encourage them or do we just say, okay, in that case, you can stay home. So that of thing can make a difference as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, yeah. Bush. For sharing that. Now you've mentioned um, Burma, so that you were there until you were a, a teenager. Can you tell us what Burma is, what Burma was like? Because now, obviously, when when people hear Burma, me and Ma, that we hear about the dictatorship and the Australian academic that they've arrested. But what what was Burma like when you were growing up? So, um, eighty percent is Buddhist. So in Burma. And also one good, uh, they and also they teach their kids really well in um, religion. Mm -hmm. So every morning, I do remember, um, every morning we went to school, we have to um, kind of like respect or salute whatever term you're using it to the flag of our nationality. And we have to, um, you know, have ha sang um, national anthem. And after that, we, each of the students go back to their, their class and have to pray. So they've been praying like every morning. So that's how they've been teaching. So I always say before I learn, um, you know, the Lord's Prayer and the Creed, I, before I learn my own Christian prayer, I know of my heart in my head of the Buddhist prayer. So this is um, the, uh, the schools that I've been growing up full of, um, you know, not only education and study, but religions is really important as well. Mm -hmm. So we actually really, truly value religion as well. So the respect for that as well. And also, yeah, so as I grow up in Burma, um, what it is like, um, it's quite, <laughs> it's been a while. So I'm just um, thinking, no, it's been really good as as in general, but the only thing is um, if you are ethnic group, then of course a certain, this is, you might not face this as a child, but as in, as in growing up, they do, you will face it when you go to workplace or into your career, because if you are ethnic group and if you are not Buddhist, then there is a certain, doesn't matter how clever you are, how smart you are, how good you are, you cannot go to a certain level. So those sort of injustices around there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and walking around like your your city, your home city, what what are what are we seeing? Are we are we seeing countryside? Are we seeing city? Are we seeing thousand year old buildings? Uh, no, we don't have that sort of buildings, historical buildings. But um, I grew up in a city, so it's more like a city life. 
but even though that you can see see the countryside as in I did remember the intercession when you stand whether you look each four of the intercession turn around you will see the mountains beautiful beautiful mountains green trees and greenland and all that sort of things but sadly I think I went back there six or seven years ago and then those sort of things gone and more dusty than still in the green yeah Oh, okay, okay. So when you went back, you did notice some, 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 bit, some changes. Yes. Well, it was lovely, lovely speaking with you. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to, to, to chat. Yeah, no, yeah, no, thank you for um, doing the interview. But for those who want to, uh, you know, interest about Burma, I would say if you are interested in culture and um, religions and have open minded, I will truly encourage you to go there. And instead, when you go there, instead of going to the um, tourist places, try to go and see the actual real life of the um, people. It's, you know, sometimes those sort of things give you more, actually, will tell you more who they are. are as well. And also, yeah, know the country is rich in history i have to say yeah full of history thank you